in terms of interventionism, but that's three very big uh, events in that one in that one year, and which really are revolutionary. And uh, a an alternative title for my talk could have been the death of federalism in America, or the final nails in the coffin of America's founding fathers. Those could have been alternative uh, uh, titles, because that's my theme. And uh, so well, I'm going to give you my conclusion first, in that uh, one of the overlooked aspects, not totally ignored, but pretty much overlooked aspects of this revolution, was that it really did end once and for all the system of federalism as it was understood by the American founding fathers. I think it was almost killed off in 1865, and then the central state spent the next 48 years consolidating its power so that there would uh, never again be a state level resistance to the growth of the centralized state. And this culminated, in my view, in 1913. And one of my favorite little books on American politics is uh, a book called America's Political Dilemma by Gottfried Dietze, spelled D-I-E-T-Z-E. -E. He, he taught uh, uh, political philosophy at uh, Johns Hopkins for many years. I don't know, maybe Bob, maybe, uh, Bob Higgs even knows him. I don't know, Bob Higgs was a Johns Hopkins student in the 60s. Uh, or was it the 30s, Bob? I guess he doesn't know him. But, uh, but explain, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the, one of the best books I know explaining really in a very short area, a short amount of space, what the founding fathers, the American founding fathers meant by federalism. And I'll read just a few of his quotes. He said, uh, federalism instituted to enable the federal government to check oppressions by the governments of the states and vice versa appears to be a supreme principle of the Constitution, end quote. And this was called dual sovereignty by Madison. Uh, the idea, whether you think it made sense or not, was that uh, the state, the citizens of the states would have certain abilities to check the tyrannical proclivities of the central state, and at the same time, the central state would have certain abilities to check the tyrannical proclivities of the states, state politicians, state and local governments. And uh, the thinking was that uh, if you want to uh, maximize liberty, this was the system that was set up in America to do so. And uh, Dietze also goes on to say, uh, quote, before the Civil War, the nature of American federalism was still a subject of debate. The outcome of the Civil War ended that debate. The nationalists emerged as victors. National power increased as the 20th century approached, along with the disappearance of states' rights, end quote. And then he goes on to say, this, quote, this constitutes a revolution that can well be termed a reverse of the revolution of 1787, that is the creation of the Constitution, where federalism, uh, understood as dual sovereignty, was certainly one of the principal uh, tenets, if not the principal tenet. And uh, uh, one final quote here regarding this period. <clears throat> uh, Woodrow Wilson, before he became president, was a uh, political science professor at uh, Princeton, as many of you know. And uh, in his book on congressional government, <clears throat> he wrote uh, in, in enthusiastically and in approval uh, this. He said, the war between the states established this principle that the federal government is, through its courts, the final judge of its own powers, end quote. And he thought that was a great thing, that the fox would be guarding the head house, hen house from here on, from here on out. That, uh, and, and, of course, this is one of the things that such people as Thomas Jefferson thought would be the end of liberty in America if you allowed ever the central government to be the final judge of the limits of its own powers. Uh, it didn't take a genius to forecast that the government would eventually get around to deciding that there are no limits to, uh, to its powers, which, which it did. Now, this system of federalism, or sometimes called states' rights or divided sovereignty, was never intended to be enforced by the Supreme Court alone. That's the thinking that most Americans certainly have today because they're used to it. That's we, we hear pronouncements by the Supreme Court or uh, who uh, Clyde Wilson calls the black-robed deities, and they interpret for us, um, you know, how much, they tell us how much freedom they're going to allow us to have. That was never intent, the intention. And uh, one illustration of how this was never the intention is uh, the history. I'm going to give a brief history in the time I have of the 17th Amendment that uh, passed in 1913 that allowed for the uh, direct election of senators by vote as opposed to being appointed by the state legislatures.
And uh, uh, some of the words of the American founders on the 17th Amendment, Roger Sherman writing to John Adams, President John Adams, he said, the senators being dependent on state legislatures for re-election will be vigilant in supporting their rights against infringement by the legislative or executive of the United States. Alexander Hamilton said, election of senators by legislatures was an absolute safeguard. Maybe a little exaggeration there, but uh, George Mason said, election of senators by legislatures gives the states some means of defending themselves against encroachments of the national government. Fisher Ames said, Senators are ambassadors of the states. Uh, Madison in Federalist Number 62 said this, the appointment of senators by state legislatures gives to state government such an agency in the formation of the federal government as, much, as must secure the authority of the former. The authority of the former. So to Madison, the states were sovereign. And that's a foreign idea to most Americans nowadays, but this is the American ideal. Uh, also, Madison said that the mere enumeration of powers, referring to Article I, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, which enumerates the powers of, of the, the federal government, would never be sufficient. He called these mere parchment barriers to the growth of the centralized state so that some sort of structural arrangements would be necessary, not just the written Constitution. And one, one structural barrier would be the appointment of uh, United States senators by state legislatures. And, uh, and also, there was uh, the insistence that the legislature should instruct the senators on how to vote, not just appoint them to office and send them off to uh, New York or Washington, the capital, but to, uh, to instruct them on how to vote. The very first instruction the senators were given was to meet in public, because as soon as, soon as they started the Senate, the senators decided, we don't need the public to know what we're talking about here. And so they've been in secret. And, uh, but they were all uh, reprimanded immediately by their state legislatures to meet in public, and they did. And uh, some examples of uh, this the 17th Amendment, uh, you know, anti-17th Amendment reasoning, the Kentucky and Virginia resolves. Uh, the, you know, James, Thomas Jefferson is, known, is the author of the so-called Kentucky Resolve of 1798, which was a, re a, a response to the Sedition Act, uh, which pretty much made it illegal to criticize the federal government. And uh, quite a few people end up in jail. Uh, every one of them was a member of Jefferson's party. And the Sedition Act uh, was scheduled to go out of existence on the very day President John Adams left office. So it was clearly a political tool by Adams and his cohorts to, uh, to uh, censor uh, criticism from the, from the opponents. And uh, James Madison co-authored the Virginia Resolve that essentially said that uh, we, the citizens of the states, are not uh, in agreement with the idea that the federal government is the sole arbiter of constitutional issues, that we reserve for ourselves the right to determine issues of constitutionality. We don't think this Sedition Act is uh, constitutional, and uh, we recommend that we just simply don't obey it, and we don't use our own courts and our own police to enforce the Sedition Act. And this was the work of the states, uh, uh, the state legislatures, who instructed their uh, senators to oppose, to oppose it. Not all the states, but uh, you know the states that did oppose it, like Kentucky and Virginia. Uh, that's how they did it. Uh, Andrew Jackson is usually given uh, the lion's share of the credit for opposing the Bank of the United States. If you come to Mises Institute conferences and there's, there's a session on the history of banking, someone will mention how Andrew Jackson had this pitched political battle with Nicholas Biddle, the, the head of the Bank of the United States, which was Alexander Hamil Hamilton's uh, brainchild. And, uh, and of course, uh, Jackson eventually won this battle and the Bank of the United States was defunded and then after that, uh, uh, after a number of years passed, we had something called the independent treasury system, which Jeff Hummel, the, uh, the uh, economic historian, uh, argues is probably the most stable monetary system we've ever had in America. And Murray Rothbard gave it pretty good marks too. You know, no system is perfect, but uh, you know, it's probably uh, the best we've ever had that was consistent with the gold standard in terms of the actual systems that we've had. And, uh, but uh, the, the opposition to the Bank of the United States was very vigorous at the state level, too. Um, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Connecticut, South Carolina, New York, and New Hampshire uh, 
issued resolutions quoting the Kentucky Resolve of 1798 and also urging their senators to oppose the Bank of the United States. This all became very different after 1865. In 1835, Senator Pellog Sprague of Maine resigned after ignoring his state legislature's instructions to vote against the Bank of the United States. The United States Senate, which had a lot of supporters of the Bank of the United States, censored Andrew Jackson for his opposition to the bank. And after that, several southern states instructed their senators to vote to reverse the censor. And since they had been in Washington, D.C. for a while, they learned to love the bank for various reasons, and they refused. And so seven southern senators were forced to resign because they refused to vote to repeal the censor of Andrew Jackson. And so in terms of what actually happened to get rid of this early version of central banking, it was the citizens of the states through their state legislatures who instructed their senators to oppose the Bank of the United States. It wasn't just the heroic Andrew Jackson riding up on his white horse with a big sword slopping the head off of Nicholas Biddle. That didn't actually happen. I kind of like that image, though, of the head of the central bank. But that's sort of the story that is sometimes told about this, but that's not the whole story. Many of the founders believed they could never make it in the Supreme Court's self-interest to protect the rights of the citizens of the states against encroachments and unconstitutional laws and such by the central government. Brutus, the anti-federalist, and the man who wrote under the name of Brutus, said this, it would never be in the self-interest of the court to strike down federal laws trenching on the inviolable and residuary sovereignty of the states, because every extension of power of the general legislature, as well as of the judicial powers, will increase the powers of the courts. And he also mentioned next that it would also likely increase the remuneration of the judges on the court, give them more powers and more responsibility, they can make a case for more pay. And so it's inherently against their self-interest to minimize the powers of the central government. And if only the modern libertarian advocates of empowering the Supreme Court to supposedly defend our liberty would read Brutus, I think we'd all be better off. And as far as I know, this argument was never refuted, it was just sort of ignored. But by the time we get to 1913, after the turn of the century, and I'll talk why there was a movement to get rid of this, well, again, it doesn't take a genius to understand if you had this pitched battle between the advocates of centralized governmental power and the advocates of liberty, which means limits on centralized governmental power, the advocates of liberty wanted the center of power to be in the citizens of the states through their legislatures. The advocates of unrestrained centralized governmental power didn't like that, and so there was a political campaign for decades to adopt what became the 17th Amendment. But there's sort of, I think, a syllogism that is used to explain the argument for the 17th Amendment. You know, syllogism has a primary premise, a secondary premise, and then a conclusion that's drawn from the first two. The primary premise is democracy leads to corruption and plunder. The secondary premise is everyone knows this. Conclusion, therefore, we need more democracy. That's basically the theory underlying the adoption of the 17th Amendment, because there was all this talk of this corruption at the state level. We have to do something about the corruption at the state level. And so, yes, you had politicians or politicians. You could have had state-level politicians who were taking bribes or senators who were taking bribes from special interests within the state of Alabama, for example. The solution, therefore, is to allow that same senator to take bribes from all the states, not just Alabama, but from the whole country. So that's why today you have the senator from Alabama going to New York and California to raise campaign funds. And you didn't have that before 1913. But it's sort of a good example of Misesian interventionism. Mises has wrote many times in many places how government intervention inevitably causes things to get worse rather than better, and then the state uses that fact to introduce even more intervention. And that's what happened in this case. In 1866, the year after the war to prevent Southern independence was over, 
the federal government uh, passed a law that for the first time mandated how state legislatures were to appoint senators. The Constitution already you know, requires senators, but, but the, the government never uh, dictated to the states how they were to go about exactly uh, appointing senators. And the way it was was first a voice vote of each house was to be taken, and then if there was no clear winner of the Senate seat, then a concurrent vote, a, a private vote, a, uh, you know, a secret vote of concurrent of both houses of the legislature would vote if, if the voice vote wasn't uh, decisive. And apparently what happened was the original uh, vote, the voice vote, informed the opponents of this or that person who they had to bribe or threaten to avoid having that person being appointed. And so uh, what ended up was deadlocks. This created deadlocks. And so you did have, uh, like one statistic I dug up, from 1885 to 1912, there were 71 deadlocks, where just uh, month after month after month would go by, and certain states did not have a senator representing them in, uh, in, uh, in, in Washington. And the deadlocks were typically ended by bribery, that if there was a deadlock, the winner would actually become the winner by, by bribery. And so, therefore, that's the, the argument was made, well, there's bribery going on here to break the deadlocks caused by the federal law, by the way. Therefore, what do we need to do? We need to pass another law that, uh, that'll, that'll do what? Well, allow them to collect bribes, as I said, from all over the country, not just their own state, uh, as they do, because the special interests who want the legislation passed that might be good for Californians, but bad for uh, the people of Alabama, they're, they're more than willing to bribe the senator from Alabama to have their, help have their le legislation passed. Um, there's a congressman, and uh, I quote here, Congressman James Blaine, on the, uh, the significance of this uh, amendment. He said this, and he's referring to the Civil War again. He said, prior to the war, every power was withheld from the national government, which could, could by any possibility be exercised by the state governments. And what he's referring to here is... Uh, before 1861, the, the only contact the average American citizen had with the central government was through the Postal Service, and taxes were minimal. They were the equivalent of about $45 a year, and so we essentially had uh, uh, you know, very tiny central government. And then Blaine, Congressman Blaine goes on to say, after the war, it was believed that everything which may be done by either nation or state may be done and more securely done by the nation, meaning the central government. And so, uh, and so what he's saying is this was one part of the impetus to eventually adopt the 17th Amendment, that this belief that the central government is so superior to anything the citizens of the states could do that we need to get rid of this idea that the, the citizens of the states should have direct control over their own senators. We should let the senators go to Washington, and because that's the, the fount of all truth is Washington, D.C. And so uh, we need to you know, get the, get the riffraff out of here. Don't let them be involved. Was sort, sort of the idea. And of course, progressivism and populism, which made a god of democracy, also added a lot of weight to the, the crusade for the 17th Amendment. That's why I said this syllogism perfectly explains this. Democracy is corrupt. Everyone knows it. Therefore, let's have more of it. That's basically uh, the argument. And um, <clears throat> as a law professor at, um, at uh, George Mason, named Todd Zwicky, who's written a couple of really interesting articles. And one of them is in the Cleveland State Law Review in 1997 on the 17th Amendment. It's one of the best scholarly articles I've run across here. And, uh, and he says something uh, really interesting and relevant to Bob Higgs's work on Crisis and Leviathan, and where he said uh, this, the ratchet effect of federal intervention persisting after the dissipation of the crisis, which pur purportedly spawned it, was absent from American history until 1913. And he argues that, that the ratchet effect of government where there's a crisis, a war or something like that, government always ratchets up its powers and its taxes. And then after the crisis, it may give us back some of our freedom, but not all of them, so that there's a permanent elevation in the size and scope of government. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with him that there was no ratchet effect before the war because for example, the, uh, the uh, internal revenue bureaucracy was created in, in the 1860s, and it never has gone away. So there was a bit of a ratchet there. Uh, and so, but, but, but probably not, not nearly as extreme as Bob Higgs documents in his book, Crisis in Leviathan, which starts in the 1890s, the historical section, 
<clears throat> but the first real big crisis that Bob writes about is World War I, which came shortly after 1913. And so in addition to creating a system where e each senator can now be bribed by everyone, everywhere, um, I think uh, uh, Zawicki makes a good case that uh, the opposition to uh, the ratchet effect to, to uh, after a crisis was eliminated um, with this. So, so that's, that's part one of the revolution of 1913. Part two is the income tax that came in, the 16th Amendment. And, uh, and to give a, a little hip historical perspective, you know, the original Constitution of the United States, uh, tariffs and excise taxes and occasional public land sales were how the government was funded. There was no income tax uh, and there were no direct taxes. All direct taxes were unconstitutional. And one of my all-time favorite uh, political statements uh, is an expression on, on, among other things, of the evils of an income tax. It's from Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address. Many of you have probably heard this before, but I'll read it because I like, I like hearing it every once in a while, where uh, Jefferson said, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. That is the sum of good government, end quote. And, of course, the relevant part here is the government shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned, no income tax. Jefferson, after the so-called Whiskey Rebellion, Jefferson also decided that even including excise taxation as a constitutional function was a bad idea. He said this, the excise law is an infernal one. The first error was to admit it by the Constitution, to allow it into the Constitution. And, of course, he went along with the elimination of all federal excise taxes as, as president. Um, the first income tax uh, by the federal government came in during the Lincoln administration. And uh, one aspect of this is that, uh, one manifestation of this is that Walter Block has been entirely too hard on Milton Friedman. Because uh, he, has, I've heard Walter say someplace uh, that Milton Friedman is the father of income tax withholding. Is Walter here? Is he even, I guess he's not here. Well, anyway. Any of you who have said that about Milton Friedman, shame on you. You're, you're, you're not telling the truth. Withholding was initiated during the Lincoln administration. <clears throat> it eventually disappeared, but then it was resurrected by Milton Friedman. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so he should be given some credit, but not as much as he's been given for this. But, uh, but you know, part of the uh, part of the, the reason for the American Revolution was the hated stamp tax that King George imposed on the colonists. That they required a purchase of a stamp for every legal document, marriage licenses, property titles. Uh, this was brought back in the Lincoln administration, the stamp tax. They instituted the first inheritance tax and the income tax. The internal revenue bureaucracy was created for the first time with 185 districts to collect taxes, and withholding was adopted, but it didn't, uh, they withheld very, almost nothing. They were, they were pretty incompetent at withholding income. It did, didn't really work that way. And, uh, the income tax, uh, it, turned, it started out as a flat tax. And maybe that's why Jack Kemp is such a big Lincoln idolater. He likes a flat tax. But then it was changed to a progressive tax uh, with rates of 5 and 10 percent. And the Constitution was simply ignored because at the time, direct taxation was unconstitutional. Uh, but they simply called the income tax an excise tax. It's like, you know, let's call it a banana or something. It's not, it's not a <laughs> direct tax. And so and, and that's how they... Got in, got along with it, and um, in the, the ability to pay principle was invented during, by the Lincoln administration to justify the progressive income tax. So we can blame him on that, blame that on uh, on the Lincoln administration also. And of course, I call the ability to pay principle the Willie Sutton philosophy. That, you know, the, the famous the bank robber Willie Sutton, robber Willie Sutton. Uh, so supposedly, when he was asked, why did you rob all those banks, he said, that's where the money is. Well, that's the ability to pay principle. Why do you tax higher income people more? That's where the money is. So it's sort of the, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of our philosophical theory behind income taxation is bank robbery. It's, it's, it's a philosophy of bank robbery. Uh, well, this tax ended in 1872, but it established the precedent of an income tax and, and whetted the appetites of all the various interests who saw how they could benefit from income taxation. And so uh, 68 bills were introduced in Congress to reinstitute the income tax between 1874 and 1894, and the seeds of, the seeds of class warfare had been planted. 
And so that's, that's why I mentioned this historical episode <clears throat> that the income tax didn't just pop up uh, all of a sudden in the, after the 20th century. This, <clears throat> this was a long fight. Uh, another example of uh, the theory of Misesian interventionism was how the farmers of America became big supporters of income taxation. And uh, the reason is, uh, when the Republican Party gained power for the first time in the late 1850s, one of the first things they did when they had the power to do it was to pass in the House of Representatives the Moral Tariff Bill, which raised the average tariff rate from about 15% to about 32%. And then it went up to around 48%, and it stayed in that range, the 45 to 50%, until 1913. And so we had very heavily protectionist tariff rates, and farmers are, are always disproportionately harmed by protectionist tariffs for, for several reasons. One, at least historically, most of these tariffs were on manufactured goods. And so that means everything they buy is more expensive, and there were some agricultural products that were protected, but the, the bulk of what was protected was manufactured goods, so they had to buy more expensive stuff. Two, <clears throat> the, they found out whether it was the southern farmers in the 1860s or 1850s or the Midwestern farmers in the 1880s, they sold a lot of what they made, what they produced, on international markets. In fact, in 1860, between 60 and 75 percent of all the agricultural produce of the South was exported and the similar numbers, you know, very big percentages of the Midwestern farmers. And so they found that the cost of farm tools, farm machinery, woolen blankets, shoes, all became more expensive, and they couldn't pass on any of this higher cost of living by charging more for cotton, tobacco, rice, and things they were growing because they had fierce competition internationally. Third, they realized that if protectionist tariffs dried up trade, which it did, their trading partners had less, fewer dollars which, with which they could buy American farm goods. And so that was sort of a triple whammy to the farmers. And so the farmers became a pressure group to reduce the tariff rate in, by implementing an income tax. And so uh, not only southern farmers, midwestern farmers, all over. And so that's how, you know, one intervention, protectionist tariffs, uh, added a tremendous amount of political support for another intervention, income taxation eventually. Uh, <clears throat> there was an income tax that was included in a part of a Revenue Act in 1894. Grover Cleveland pocket vetoed it, and then the, uh, but it became law for a short while, and then uh, the Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional. Uh, when, when the income tax was finally adopted in 1913, I don't, I, I'm not going to go over the whole story of uh, all the intrigue about it, it was a, a classic bait and switch uh, political bait and switch scheme where the promise was made that the protectionist tariff in the 50% range would be dropped very significantly in return for the income tax. That's what the farmers wanted and anybody else who, uh, who was export dependent uh, uh, wanted. But uh, this was 1913, but the 1922 Fordney McCumber Tariff Act increased the average rate back up to 33.22% and the smoot hawley hoover tariff of 1930 raised it to an average of, of about 60 percent, almost 60 percent. was uh, this, It's usually called the smoot hawley tariff, but Hoover was for it, so the smoot hawley hoover tariff. So it was bait and switch. We'll cut your, your tariff rate if you give us the income tax. Okay, said the foolish uh, farmers. They, they cut it for a few years, but it, it raised right back up. And, of course, the income tax in, itself was another big bait and switch scheme um, the original income tax, the first bracket, you had to make $20,000 to be in the 1% bracket. The top bracket uh, was 7%. No one paid more than 7%, and you had to make $500,000 to be in the 7% tax bracket. And this was in 1914 when it came into, into being. So that's $500,000 would jingle in your pocket a little bit in 1913. Uh, even today it would. But, uh, but then during the war, the war, you know, the war came, as Abraham Lincoln said. He had nothing to do with it. But World War I came. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson had nothing to do with it. It just came. And so he had to uh, raise taxes so that by, by 1918, the, uh, the, top, the first rate was 6%, when the, from 1 to 6. And the income, you only had to make $4,000 instead of $20,000 to be in that bracket. 
And the top rate was increased from 7 to 77 percent on income of a million. You had to make a million, but 77 percent. But even after the war, by 1928, it was still the top rate was 1 and an eighth percent on $4,000 of income instead of 20,000. And the top rate was still 25 percent in, uh, in 1928. On, uh, and you had to make only $100,000 for the 28 percent rate. So there's a, that's a pretty good ratchet there. And, uh, and among the consequences, uh, you know, I don't have to go on in this crowd and, with, and talk about much of the consequences of income taxation, but I thought I'd, I'd run across some of the ones that maybe you haven't really realized uh, or thought about these for a while. Uh, of course, class hatred was uh, institutionalized forever with the income tax, uh, progressive income tax. Debtor prison was reinstituted. Debtor prison was ended officially by President John Adams, the second president of the United States. But, uh, you know, if you don't pay your income tax, you go to prison. If you owe a debt to the government, you're going to prison. So that debtor prison was brought back. Uh, but more, more importantly for my theme here, I think the income tax represented as much as, as anything the total destruction of federalism or states' rights altogether because the states really became mere appendages or franchi franchisees of the federal government, of the central government in the U.S., and the government became totally consolidated because it had its, its hands in everybody's pocket uh, for the first time ever. And the Constitution was no longer able to keep the central government off balance uh, with the income tax, as the founders hoped, because of the destruction of, of federalism and the income tax. And an another aspect of this is that, you know, when Jefferson said uh, the sum of good government is to not take the bread away from, uh, from the man who earns it. That was an expression of the Lockean natural rights philosophy that, you know, that, you know part of your, your life, liberty, and property is the income you earn from your own toil. And for the state to take that away from you, they're depriving you some of your, your, your property. Uh, and so, so they saw, Jefferson, I believe, saw this as an inherent attack on the natural rights of, of, of Americans. Well, the income tax turns that to completely around, and it establishes the principle that rather than protecting natural rights, the government is going to destroy natural rights by taking income through income taxation. So it totally turned on its head the natural rights philosophy of the founders, in my view. It's also a denial of private property. It was a severe attack on private property. Uh, Frank Chodorov said this as well as anybody ever has, I think, in his book, The Income Tax. He said, what it means is that your earnings are not exclusively your own. We, have, we, the government, have a claim on them, and our claim precedes yours. We will allow you to keep some of it because we recognize your need but not your right. But what it, whatever we grant you for yourself is for us to decide. So you're essentially a slave, uh, and, and the government will decide for you how much of your income you get to keep. It could change its mind on a whim if it wants. And... Uh, and, of course, the civil society always shrinks whenever government grows, and the income tax was the major driving force behind that. The capital structure of the country was permanently damaged since so much of the income that is taxed away would have been saved and invested. And the income tax created the high time preference society that America has been and has suffered from for, the, for decades now. And Murray Rothbard explained this in Man, Economy, and State of how the, the existence of income taxation causes an increase in the rate of time preference of the population. And I'll read this short uh, uh, section from Man, Economy, and State. An income tax will particularly penalize saving and investment as against consumption. It might be thought that since the income tax confiscates a certain portion of a man's income and leaves him free to allocate the rest between consumption and investment, and since time preference schedules remain given, the proportion of consumption to saving will remain unchanged. But this ignores the fact that the taxpayer's real income and the real value of his monetary assets have been lowered by paying the tax. We have seen that given a man's time preference schedule, the lower the level of his real monetary assets, the higher his time preference rate will be, and therefore the higher proportion of his consumption to investment. And so uh, that's another thing that was set off by the advent of, of the income tax, the high time preference um, society that, uh, that uh, Hans Hoppe writes so eloquently about in his in, uh, Democracy, the God that Failed. 
uh, the third leg of the revolution of 1913, and I'm not going to go on and on about the Fed. This, this audience is pretty well schooled on the Fed, uh, I think. I, I could tell when I, when I presented the image of chopping off the head of the, the, head of the Fed with a sword that everybody laughed uh, in enjoyment of that. In D.C., you wouldn't get any laughter at that uh, <laughs> at all. But, <clears throat> but, the, but the, the story I would tell about the Fed and the creation of the Fed is that it was a, a, a political struggle that began with Alexander Hamilton and his Bank of the United States and up through the second Bank of the United States and Andrew Jackson's destruction of it uh, and then it's, it's re the resurrection of a, of a central bank during the Lincoln administration with the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts and then it was uh, expanded tremendously finally in 1913. So I see the creation of central banking in America as a part of this ongoing uh, political struggle that occurred in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in invariably the advocates of some kind of a centralized bank, whether it was the Bank of the United States, the National Currency Acts of 1863, or the Fed itself, were advocates of bigger government, more activist government, more centralized government. Invariably the opponents of a centralized bank were the advocates of liberty, limited government, decentralized government. And uh, Richard Timberlake, in his uh, book, in his Monetary Policy of the United States, uh, has some interesting statements about the early battle over central banking between the Whigs, who were the precursors of part of the political apparatus that were the precursors of the Republicans. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Whig for 28 years and a Republican for you know, just a few years compared to that. And he said this about the Whigs. To the Whigs, a national bank was their life the vital principle without which they could not live as a party, the power which was to give them power. To lose it was to lose the fruits of the election with the prospect of losing the party itself. So it meant everything for the centralized power. And, uh, and he also and, uh, uh, talks about Jackson, uh, as does uh, Robert Remini, the, the, the best biographer of Jackson and the Bank War, is the book uh, on, it's called Andrew Jackson and the Bank War by Robert Remini. He said this, that uh, Jackson believed that the doctrine of states' rights meant that a central bank was unconstitutional. And this view was quite pervasive, especially in the South. And, and then uh, Timberlake, I'm switching over to Timberlake again, where he writes, the states were properly jealous and fearful of encroachment by the federal government. Since a central bank would necessarily be a federal bank and would maintain and operate state branches from a distant center, Proponents of states' rights found opposition to a national bank almost mandatory. And so from the early days, you had this mandatory political battle between the advocates of Hamiltonianism, centralized governmental power, and the advocates of Jeffersonianism. And when, when, when Lincoln's banking legislation, which was the real precursor of the Fed, uh, came online, the sponsor of the bill for the National Currency Act was Congressman Elbridge G. Spaulding, a New York banker, by the way. What a coincidence. He happened to be a banker. He's a sponsor of the Nationalized Banking Act. And, uh, and uh, he was interviewed apparently by the New York Times, uh, which said this on March 9, 1863, about, about these acts. They said, the Legal Tender Act and the National Currency Bill crystallized a centralization of power such as Hamilton might have eulogized as magnificent, end quote. Uh, one of the big opponents at the time of uh, centralized banking was Kentucky Democrat Lazarus Powell, who wasn't quite as enthusiastic uh, about this. He said this, he said, the result of this legislation is utterly to destroy the rights of the states. It is asserting a power which, if carried out to its logical result, would enable the National Congress to destroy every institution of the states and cause all power to be consolidated and concentrated here in Washington. And, and of course, he was dead on on that, wasn't he? Um, there's a, an author uh, named Richardson who wrote a book called The, uh, the, Greatest, uh, the Greatest Government on the Earth about the, uh, the, uh, the Congress during the Lincoln administration. And, so, and since they passed the National Currency Acts and, and uh, subsidies for the Transcontinental Railroad and protectionist tariffs, that qualifies them as the greatest government on the earth. Uh, and and uh, she said this about the banking acts. 
By 1863, the Republicans envisioned a dominant international role for a unified American nation, and Senator John Sherman promised that the bank bill, with its implicit strengthening of the national government, would advance that goal. The Republicans uh, were building a new economic role for an increasingly powerful national government, permanently involving it in the country's monetary affairs. And so they, they, were, they, they wanted imperialism, they wanted empire, and it takes a lot of money to have an empire. And, and of course, the Fed expanded this in spades 48 years later uh, it was, with, with the Fed. It was bad enough for the National Currency Acts and Legal Tender Acts, but the Fed was just a tremendous expansion of, of this. One of the books I've read recently on the history of the income tax, one of the authors says, uh, thank goodness that uh, we adopted the income tax and the Fed in 1913. Otherwise, America may not have been able to enter World War I. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what, a, what a disaster that would have been. That's that, that, idea, that idea that the war just came, that the individuals have nothing to do with getting us into war. They just, they just come and go like traffic, uh, the tides in the ocean, uh, no human action involved here. <clears throat> but So, uh, you know, in, in closing on, on the significance of this, I think these three things were the final nails in the coffin of the, the whole system of federalism or states' rights that, 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 that was meant to constrain the central government. Uh, you know, to the extent that the Americans were meant to be the masters rather than the servants of their own government, this is how they were meant to be the masters of their own government, through political communities organized at the state level. Whether you like it or not, that was the system. And, and uh, one of the things uh, about this is that, you know, that was, that was the way in which limited constitutional government was uh, supposed to operate uh, here in this country. And of course, countries all over the world have adopted federalism. Uh, you know, one, one author, uh, Forrest MacDonald, who wrote a book on states' rights not too long ago, uh, pointed out the irony that this was an American idea, and it does exist in countries all over the world, but not here anymore, even though it was invented here. And we, we got rid of it. And um, uh, I, I want to close with a, a quotation from Ludwig von Mises here and another German language political philosopher. I want to ask you to guess who the second one is. But in Omnipotent Government, on page 268, <clears throat> Mises is talking about the growth of government in both America and Switzerland in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And here's what he says about the growth of government in Omnipotent Government. It says, new powers accrued in these years, not to member states, meaning individual states, provinces, but to the federal government. Every step toward more government interference and toward more planning means at the same time an expansion of the jurisdiction of the central government. Washington and Bern were once the seats of the federal governments. Today they are capitals in the true sense of the word and the states and cantons are virtually reduced to the status of provinces. It is a very significant fact that the adversaries of the trend toward more government Control described their opposition as a fight against Washington and against Bern, i.e., against centralization. It is conceived as a contest of states' rights versus the central power. End quote. So, to Mises, the whole battle for liberty was a contest of states' rights versus the central power, the centralized government. And uh, there's a German political philosopher. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, philosopher. I know again we have at least one or two real experts in this, <clears throat> just to contrast the kind of thinking that this was a contemporary of Mises. He died quite a long time before Mises died, but he was a contemporary of Mises, a very influential one for quite some time, where he said uh, this, uh, commenting on American history, this German philosopher said, the individual states of the American Union could not have possessed any sovereignty of their own for it was not these states that formed the Union. On the contrary, it was the Union which formed a great part of the so-called states. And so he's saying that state sovereignty never really existed in America because the Union created the states, the states didn't create the Union. This is the German philosopher. He's paraphrasing Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. And, and this is what, so I'm going to read, this is what Lincoln's first inaugural address says. The Union is much older than the Constitution. It was formed, in fact, by the Articles of Association in 1774, 
It was matured and continued by the Declaration of Independence. It was further matured by the Articles of Confederation. And finally, in 1787, one of the declared objects for ordaining and establishing the Constitution was to form a more perfect union. So this German philosopher was just quoting Abraham Lincoln in, the, in making the case for, for abolishing state sovereignty in Germany. And of course, this is complete nonsense because if you think about it, a, a union of two things cannot logically be older than either of the things. <laughs> it's, like, it's like saying a marital union can be older than either spouse, either part of the union. It, it doesn't make any sense. And besides the fact, it's not historical. It didn't happen that way. The same German philosopher said this, that uh, the ideal thing for Germany would, quote, totally eliminate states' rights altogether. Since for us, the state as such is only a form, but the essential is its content, the nation, the people, the real nationalist this fellow was. It is clear that everything else must be subordinated to its sovereign interests. In particular, we cannot grant to any individual state within the nation and the state representing it state sovereignty and sovereignty in point of political power. The mischief of individual federated states must cease. You know, any guess who that was? Anyone? That was Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf. <laughs> and so, and so, just to make the point that the worst tyrants in world history were also on the side of centralized power and enemies of states' rights. And uh, but I think the final thing I would say is that this was America's attempt at limited constitutional government. And the way I see it is as soon as the central government became powerful enough to destroy state sovereignty, it did. When the southern states attempted to say we no longer consent to being governed by the central government, the central government responded by killing 300,000 of them, one out of four adult uh, males of military age, bombing their cities, burning out their homes and farms, and generally ruining the whole society. Uh, and, uh, and we can talk more about that. And then the final nails in that coffin were pounded in 1913, in my view. And so uh, that's pretty strong evidence that limited constitutional government just won't work. And uh, you know, it had as good a chance as here as anywhere. Uh, but it was destroyed. It took a while, but it was destroyed uh, not that long, really. So 1789 until 1913 in the span of, span of history is not that, uh, that long a time period. But that's, I guess my time's almost up. We have a few minutes for questions. That's, that's all I'm going to say for now. I guess we have a few minutes. For, yeah. In the debates over the uh, amendment for the income tax, were, were there any uh, movements to try to limit it right mm. from the get-go? To, to limit the income tax? Yeah, within the, the amendment language itself, so you can't go over 5% of income. Uh, well, there were limits placed on it, yes. So the, the originally, the originally, the limits were very, very low. Only the well, very wealthy. The legislation. It was only for the. About in the actual amendment itself, in the debates uh, over the amendment. Um, as I recall, yeah, I, I read through all this, uh, you know, several times years ago, and then more recently. I, I think there was. But somebody who wanted to write into the Constitution that would never go over 10%, and they mm -hmm. laughed at it. The people won't allow that to buy anyhow, so that's why yeah. I wasn't. Yeah, that, that's Roderick was going to say that. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. They were, they were called alarmists. They were never going to rise as high as 10%, so you don't need a tax. Yeah, it's only for the Ted Kennedys of the world, <laughs> the income tax, <laughs> the high rate. Uh, this, this man, then we'll get somebody from the back. Uh, uh, a couple questions and one comment. Um, wasn't the concept, actually the, the term, United States citizen, <coughs> created by the 17th Amendment? Because prior <coughs> to that, my understanding is you are a citizen of your state. Uh, no, I don't think it was the 17th Amendment. It was 1865 when that became the, the use of the language. Uh, the Shelby Foote, the famous Civil War history uh, author, uh, you know, what, if anybody ever asked me, uh, can you recommend a good book on just the history of the American Civil War, I was Shelby Foote is, is sort of the, the classic. And uh, one of the things he says in there is that that war changed uh, the United States, the language from the United States are to the United States is. <clears throat> because in all the founding documents, in the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, whenever the, con the, uh, the it's always the United States are, meaning the, the independent and sovereign states are united in forming a confederacy. And when, when, uh, when the Revolutionary War ended, King George signed a peace treaty with all the individual states. If you look up the Treaty of Paris, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a treaty with 
Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and plantations, New Jersey, Virginia. It's not, a, it's not with something called the United States. But after the American Civil War, the language became the United States are, in, uh, United States is rather, it became a unified, consolidated em empire, in, in my view. And even uh, I've written an article on LewRockwell.com about the origins of the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, by, uh, authored by Francis Bellamy, who was a Christian socialist. And you can read, you can read up on his history on the internet uh, or, and elsewhere. There have been a couple of books written about him. And, uh, and he said one of his purposes was sort of the, he doesn't use the word brainwash, but I will brainwash American school children into sort of worshiping the unified state. The United States is for, for, uh, for, for purposes of adopting sort of utopian socialism. His cousin, uh, Walter, was it Walter Bellamy? His cousin, Edward, Edward Bellamy, yeah, Edward Bell Bellamy, wrote this book called uh, Looking Backward, I think was the book, about uh, sort of a Rip Van Winkle experience. He wakes up in 1980 the, and he lives in socialist utopia, sort of, you know, the Soviet Union in 1918 or something like that, and how wonderful it would be. And Francis Bellamy said one of the reasons for the Pledge of Allegiance was to you know, join in the effort of, of promoting this socialist utopia idea. And you can only have socialism uh, with a centralized state. If you have competing sovereigns, it's not going to work. If you can opt out, it doesn't work. And so, and so that's, that's one, the... One follow-up question coming to you. Um, and, and that was, um, can you comment, you mentioned you didn't want to talk about the irregularities in the ratification of the 16th Amendment, but um, can, you, have you, can you summarize briefly um, you know, whether it was properly ratified, in your opinion? The 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment. Yeah, I, I think it was, and it, I think it's kind of a moot question, too, because, you know, if, if the federal government has enough guns to enforce it, it was properly ratified. The, the, four, the 14th Amendment was not properly ratified. That's, that's obvious. If you look, you know, they, they, they kicked the southern states out of the Union after fighting a war, supposedly because they left the Union, and they kicked them out and blackmailed them, said you can't come back in unless you vote to pass the 14th Amendment. And, uh, but then, they, you know, since they had the guns, uh, they just declared it's law. And so that, that's my thinking anyway, that uh, it's sort of moot to even, uh, although you mentioned the income tax in, in a libertarian group, there's always someone who is absolutely convinced that it's not constitutional, that he does not have to pay the income tax. And that, uh, good luck to you, if, if that's what that's you, that's you believe. I, I think uh, Kevin had his hand up, and then Mar uh, Marcus, after, if we have time. Just on, on that. Two What book are you referring to? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I, I'd rather focus on the, uh, the, the impact, the arguments for it and against it that, that were made, and the impact of it. You know, we've got decades and decades of research on the impact of income taxation, and, uh, and that, that would require sort of a lawyer's argument, uh, whether, whether it was, uh, I think, and I'm, and I'm not a lawyer, so, uh, but I think it was, uh, I think it was. Uh, for my non-lawyers thinking, so I'm not I, I'm, I'm not uh, going to get into that. <clears throat> Mostly because I don't want the IRS after me. If I, <laughs> if I'll be on their list of kooks. If uh, I'm, I'm sure I already are, am on that list, but uh, but at least I'm not a income tax denial kook yet. <laughs> and so uh, so I don't want to I don't want to get on that list. We have time for one more. Uh, okay, so Marcus, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you look if Well, I'd give him some of the blame, but yeah, he was, uh, you know, this this was a, a, a long political movement. It wasn't just Woodrow Wilson. He he supported it, uh, certainly. But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I were writing a book on Woodrow Wilson, I wouldn't pin the blame on the income tax, even the majority of it on Woodrow Wilson, even though it happened on his watch. Uh, yeah, there were other forces that were much more responsible for, for the income tax. I'd give him some, some credit for, for it, though. But on the Pledge of Allegiance, you can look it up on the Internet. There, uh, Lou Rockwell has put up on his site in the past 
do a Google search on LouRockwell.com for Pledge of Allegiance, and there are photographs of American school children <clears throat> in the uh, 30s and 40s doing this. And then, uh, of course, after, when Hitler and Mussolini came around, they decided it was this. But that, but that was but for decades. It, that was the Pledge of Allegiance. American school children were were were, were, they were doing this. Uh, that's the origins of that. I think I think that's. that's